Yeah, I, I still think I need a producer. It would be so much better if I had a producer. <coughs> you could like, oh, <coughs> become like a YouTube influencer. Oh, man, it's Friday. <coughs> Rolling through the week again. Uh, it's good to see people on the street. I guess that means someday we'll get to see each other, which will be nice. Because I miss y'all. <clears throat> so, anyways, uh, I'm going to continue today, not with a very long, uh, necessarily long class, uh, maybe about 30 minutes, but I just want to wrap up this idea of resistance to change. <clears throat> uh, last class, we were on page 69, and most of the examples that were given up until page 69 were related to issues about the change from the management side. So I think it is important to separate uh, the management, the change, <coughs> the resistance. There's a resistance to change strategically on the management side. And there's a resistance to change, let's say, culturally, business culturally, uh, within the business. And the management of both sides can be very tricky. Um, if the staff obviously see the company as falling or, or in danger, or they feel like uh, the management doesn't have a clear strategy, it's going to make them insecure in the company, especially if they can see it. Um, if they're changing halfway, but they're not really going for it, you know, everyone will know. That's the thing. <laughs> everyone, everyone can sense when things in an organization is going, you know, are going poorly. SIC. I don't know how, but still, it's kind of magic how it happened. I, I really, I think there's a few students left over this year who um, started uh, three years ago, and our recruitment was bad. It wasn't going well. Um, <clears throat> we had a really strange principal for a few years, and our numbers went very, very low. And then Mr. Huang was able to uh, do a marketing campaign and really turn around our numbers. And now we're as big as we've ever been. So um, I can tell you from the staff point of view, we were really worried about the direction of the school. As you know, I've been here for more than <laughs> since the time of the school's beginning. So I've seen it go up and then down and then up again. So it's, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of changes, not so many management changes, which can surprise the staff at times. <clears throat> well, principal changes. You know, we had very steady management on the Australian side for many years. Um, anyway, uh, the staff, the point is, the staff is going to be able, you know, they have their own kind of point of view. And it's different from management's point of view, and their idea about change may not be the same as management's. I'm going to start with staff attitude on page 69. <clears throat> staff may feel uh, these are reasons for resistance to change. <clears throat> uh, staff may feel that the, uh, they do not have the skills to learn a new system. Actually. This is more of an overview. Let's do this, and then we'll do this. <clears throat> a degree of resistance is normal since change is a degree, that is, not total, uh, since it's disruptive and stressful. And a degree of skepticism, skepticism means, hmm, is it really going to be better? Can be healthy. Agreed especially where there are weaknesses in the proposed changes. The idea that people ask questions and want to know more about the reasons for the change is to strengthen the change, not to cut it down all the time. Um, of course, some resistance will also block the objectives of the organization. 
Um, why is change resisted? Well, self-interest. I mean, but that's not, you know, if your job is on the line, of course you have self-interest. Self-interest, I mean, the business is selfish. So everyone involved in the business has self-interest. Let's not pretend that some people should be more altruistic than others. Uh, individuals are generally concerned with the implications for themselves. The word parochial usually means that it's like a short-sighted view. And that's not necessarily, and it's negative, right? But I think self-interest is actually um, not necessarily, I mean, people shouldn't be selfish, but they should be concerned about themselves, for sure. Misunderstanding, of course, communication problems. Sometimes the management will say, just do it, do what I said, why? Because I said, okay, that's, you know, from your parents, you can understand how that kind of management style can be ineffective. In it, inadequate information, uh, perhaps the, you know, the staff is giving some, I, 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 recently I was given, not for this school, but for another school, some observation forms, and I was supposed to make comments on about the online teaching of another teacher. I'm supposed to observe that and comment. Why? This teacher I'm observing has the same experience that I do, has like 15 years of experience. Am I supposed to learn something from them? Am I supposed to give them advice? What is the point? Totally unexplained point. So, inadequate information. Uh, low tolerance of change. Obviously, change can lead to a sense of insecurity because you're not confident, because you did something and you were good at it, and now you might not be good at it. <clears throat> Sometimes there's a different assessment of the situation. Sometimes there's conflict about whether or not there is a need for change or what kind of change is needed. And whether perhaps the disadvantages are going to be stronger than the advantages of the change. So uh, this is you know this is definitely between employees and management can be a different assessment of the situation. <clears throat> Why staff might welcome change? Let's throw this one. Let's let's let Jim talk for a minute. So the reason why change might be resistant. But on the other hand, we mustn't just assume that the employees in, in an organization or the organization as a whole will say, well, no, no, we, want to, we don't want change. People will be, and actually, this is a welcome relief to people within the organization. You know, you suddenly, ex you suddenly explain that we're bringing two organizations together in a big merger. Well, that provides opportunities for some people, maybe threats to others. Uh, reorganizing organizational structure. Uh, de layering, which is a great example of step change, provides for those who are left in the organization, for those who are given new responsibility, it provides a, a great way of improving their, their work experience and their prospects. So I don't always assume that people will resist change because it depends what the nature of the change is. For everyone's threat, there's usually somebody thinking, great news is exactly what I want to happen. And of course, the other thing to remember is that there's a very clear relationship between the process of change management and leadership. Now, we're going to touch on, on change when we look in, in a separate topic briefly on leadership and leadership. So, when we go on, <clears throat> yeah, so the rest of this post uh, resistance to change topic is going to be about leadership and how we can imagine. Uh, helping people to accept change <clears throat> and leading them through the change. So let me go through page 69 a little. <clears throat> Staff may feel that they do not have the skills to learn new systems and processes. Zoom, classroom, for example. They may resist because of a fear of failure. I'm effective at what I do now and I might not be as effective. Staff, in this case, must be supported. There must be training and education to support the change, which we have very little. <clears throat> and there must be a realistic time frame. No, just start doing online classes now. 
<laughs> implement, implement the change. It's also a good idea to acknowledge how difficult the change is and to celebrate success along the way. That part <clears throat> is very useful when our management tells us that we're trying hard and they see that we're trying to be as effective as we possibly can and they understand that it is difficult for us to use Zoom in classroom. Staff may feel overwhelmed or powerless when faced with major changes in the workplace. Some employees may embrace them and others may remember bad experiences from the past. Like when Thanos made half of the people disappear. I don't want Thanos to come back. Yeah, but this time Thanos is going to be different. Really? Past experiences of workplace change that was managed badly may result in the staff feeling uh, post-traumatic stress, pessimistic, cheated from before, and critical of how it will be done. So, how you may manage your change. This is about management change, the role of leadership. If you, make, uh, if you are not good at managing change before, it may lead to a situation where uh, people do not trust another change in the future. <clears throat> another aspect is a person's tolerance for risk or uncertainty. People with a high tolerance for risk or uncertainty may have an attitude of change being a challenge, an opportunity to learn something new or just part of life. Others with a low tolerance will experience fear, stress, and worry about something replacing the routines of the past. Uh, you don't have to think of it as a personality problem. <clears throat> this seems to talk about people who are risk takers and risk averse. No, you don't have to think of it that way. You can think of it as people who have children and families and people who are young and single. I want stability if i am you know, got a family. It's just normal. It's not my personality has changed or I don't like risk. It's just like I need to feed four people, not one. So, uh, yeah, so stress of the job is to recognize the family situations of your employees as well. Staff attitude towards the company and management will also have an impact on the success of a change, the trust level. If employees trust managers and have a good working relationship from the past, or whatever, now, they are more likely to commit to the change and to forgive if there's mistakes made along the way. If there is an attitude of mistrust, however, if the employees do not believe that the management can succeed, then, as our friend John Cotter would say, you just got to kill them all and let God sort them out. He is the meanest guy in the world, John Cotter. And they really strongly mean that. These are the guys that resist to the death. We have a tendency to try to pull them in, to co-opt them into the process, to work away and change their minds. And my tip is forget it. Get them out of the way. Kill them. Get them out of the way. <clears throat> Doomed to failure. <clears throat> but, you know, he's not looking, just John Cotter, he doesn't think about the past and the history of the organization he's always working for management this guy so that's why I don't trust him he never is thinking of staff he's thinking of the people who are blocking the management so that's why he's very popular with managers but I'm sure he's not loved by staff or his children maybe <laughs> I'm sorry I can't help it this guy scares me ripple effects a ripple effect is like when you throw a rock into a pond and you can see the ripples go and the waves of the tsunami go across far on the other side of the pond. Um, one change creates more changes and sometimes some people can see how those changes are going to reflect in the organization better than others. So I think I mentioned last uh, video about uh, changes in uh, management structure. 
Changes create ripples throughout the workplace. And the ripples will disrupt other departments, the suppliers, maybe customers, and this may lead to resistance of change too, because people can see that the change will have other effects, not just the ones that are intended. Change can affect people and systems in ways that were not anticipated. Same meaning, leaders should enlarge the circle of stakeholders. So this means that if you're going to try to use leadership to uh, help manage your change, then one of the better things you can do is to consult people who are going to be affected at the change because they might see things that you do not see. <clears throat> like ripple effects. They must consider all the affected parties, however indirect, and work with them to make the change successful, blah, 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 and just to see clearly what all the effects will be. Loss of control. People are territorial. People have their autonomy. They have their way of working. And so in some cases, it's not just political, as in who has power, but rather, it has to do with our self-determination and our uh, sense of, uh, you know, when we do a job, we want to feel like we know what we're doing and we uh, can do it well and we can execute and meet our targets. <clears throat> so, uh, again, leadership is involved in trying to manage the, uh, the fallout from the change, to understand what each, to, you know, we know from motivation theory, again, that uh, different people have different needs, like esteem, for example. Timing, probably, well, I don't want to say that. <clears throat> I've seen in the COVID-19, in the COVID-19 days, I've seen many shops close. Um, a lot of signs. I mean, if you haven't been going outside your house over the last months, uh, you might have not. You, you, you will be surprised. A lot of shops are gone. Um, <clears throat> I had a computer problem from the company that I buy from called Fongvu. Fongvu. Fongvu has a branch on uh, the Winter Minkai Street. Also, Fongvu has a branch on Kanghua Street. And I went to Kampwa Street because it's near here, and they're closed. So it looks to me like the company is bringing its branches together or trying, they're not out of business, they look good. I went to the Winter Kai, everything is normal, but maybe they can't afford to have so many shops anymore, so they had to bring together some of their shops. This would be, uh, so yeah, so in this COVID-19 time, some companies are crashing, <clears throat> some are consolidating, meaning to get uh, more, uh, bring their, um, narrow the number of outlets that are successful, not risking as much. Uh, and I've seen some cafes and businesses that are closed say, oh, okay, this is a perfect time to do a painting on the outside, to make our chairs nicer, to redesign. So, in some cases, uh, there might be some chance for companies to improve when they have this forced time to, to uh, without uh, any business for two months, three months. But in general, uh, yes, there are some times that are poor timing for a change. Change must be introduced, I'm on page 70, must be introduced when there's no other major initiatives going on and not at a busy time of year. Tet would be a stupid time to have uh, a change, usually. I think that would be a bad time. Uh, undue resistance can occur because changes are introduced in an insensitive manner at an awkward time. Timing is important, as we saw with innovation as well. Uh, resistance to change may not always be negative. Some managers, as we saw already, right, some managers and workers may feel that it's welcome. They might realize that, oh, okay, finally, we're getting up to speed. We're getting with the program. So uh, that would be a benefit to the business, 
right? That would be a good thing. <clears throat> so in the next, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a little bit here about leadership from Jim again, and close the lesson fairly quickly here because they're gonna close SIC in about 10 minutes and I'm gonna save our next lesson which is about Carl Leuven, who is the original pre-John Cotter change guru, God. <clears throat> but uh, for a few minutes, let's check out what Jim has to say about leadership in change. <clears throat> Between the process of change management and leadership. Now we're going to touch on, on change when we look in a separate topic review on leadership and leadership styles. But just for now, I think it's worth just reminding you that in order for step change or strategic change as I've written here, in order for that to be successful, I think it's pretty clear that the organisation or the business needs strong leadership. And ideally, these leadership who have been through the change management process before. So the role of the leader is not just to explain and to announce the change, but it's to, to create that vision. Why do we need to change? What might the benefits of this be? What are the driving forces? And create a bit of hope and a bit of blue sky as to actually it's a good thing to get behind. And then making sure that the organisation is aligned to what that vision is. So explain very clearly, communicating what the change process is going to be, what the implications are for those in the business, and what uh, perhaps some of the downsides are, what the likes of costs are. Honesty is obviously a key issue there, as you need to change program. It's undoubtedly true that a key part of leadership is, is deciding when change is required, and then having identified it, pushing it through, making it work. Tiger. One of the benefits of having somebody new come into an organisation, in particular a new leadership, perhaps a new CEO, is that that actually can help make change happen. And there are quite a Wait a second, let's think about this for a minute before he finishes. <clears throat> you know, uh, yeah, so let's say that we're going to have some change. We want to manage some change into the future um, and I decide to uh, the, my choice of management might determine how the perception of the change is going to go. For example, if I choose somebody who's within the organization, if I choose someone who's already known by everyone, I might make a signal that the change is kind of um, incremental, that for the most part we're generally satisfied with what's going on, that we don't really, um, uh, that, you know, that we just, we, the people that we have have the skills to make the change. If I bring in a manager or a new leadership from outside of the group that we know already in order to implement the change, change. Not only am I saying that, you know, I don't think that we're really ready or that we have the skills to make the change at the moment, uh, but I'm actually signaling that I have a real high expectation about a larger change and frankly, <laughs> I'm bringing in somebody who doesn't have a relationship to you. So they're not, you know, maybe they're more objective, maybe they can see, uh, you know, maybe what you tell them, they don't have an emotional connection to it and they can take it in an objective, scientific way, but they also don't know all the levels of your hierarchy of needs. They don't know your mass low, they don't know who you are, and so uh, it can signal to the staff that they're going to be in, uh, that the change might just happen whether they like it or not, put it that way. So, uh, here they, uh, he said, you know, new CEO, fresh perspective, not bound by the relationships or constraints um, of the past. A few examples out there, aren't there, of, of, of organizations that have brought in new CEOs or new senior leaders 
at the same time as embarking on the change programme. And uh, one of the benefits this does is it, it, it brings in a new perspective, it provides a mandate for change. You know, the existing CEO departs, somebody new comes in and says, yeah, strategic review, we're going to make a change here, a step change. And actually they've got a mandate, haven't they, to, to pursue that program. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the CEO. For example, it can be bringing in new operational or functional management as part of the change process. That can help accelerate the, uh, the process. And of course, what, what often happens in major complex change programs is the CEO also brings in excellent consultants to help to help shape and project manage the change program. And I've been through a few of those over the years and I've got a view on how effective those consultants are. But it's undoubtedly true that there are a lot of, of, of quite successful change management consultants who help make the change happen. So let's just summarise the, the very clear link between leadership and change management. And essentially the role of leadership here is it's not about doing the day-to-day -day stuff. It's about stating the case for change, developing very clear vision as to why the change is needed, what's involved, why the organisation needs to do it, what the effects will be. I guess more importantly to handle a special change. How is this going to happen? Uh, lots of research has been done about which change management processes have been successful and why. And conversely, change management has been unsuccessful and why. And there's some quite interesting stuff that comes out of that that you could use to help develop your, your answers in, in a relevant way. Essentially, change management processes that succeed happen where there is decisive action, firm leadership. And it creates an almost unstoppable momentum for change that overcomes the resistance. So the new CEO comes in and acts decisively, so he or she says, this is what we're going to do. They involve the organisational uh, stakeholders, in particular senior management and the employees in the change process, consulting, informing frequently, but not getting communication in the way of taking action. So it's a change program that has very clear deliverables and is delivered quickly. Speed appears to be a key characteristic of successful change management programs. But also flexibility, not just necessarily just pushing ahead, but recognising if you, if you identify some resistance or an issue, if you can just deviate around it and find a, find a solution. Conversely, the evidence around why change management fails. <coughs> so, yeah, again, this is, you know, a lot of change, a lot of change fails. Um, uh, and this is mostly what there is in the book, so I don't really think we need to go and go through the whole thing, but uh, employees are not really understanding the purpose, or they do. <laughs> they might understand the purpose and the purpose is not good for them, so that's something that needs to be thought about. <clears throat> uh, not enough planning and preparation, you know, like uh, he said that it, uh, Jim said that uh, successful change goes fast. Speed is important, execution. Not enough planning means it's going to be delayed. Poor communication to employees, maybe the skills are not quite there yet, or the training, um, lack of necessary resources, uh, could be financial, could be human resources. Um, and. When we get to the next part, we'll talk about this, rewards, rewards for uh, meeting some of the targets. So that's all for today. Uh, I hope you're having a lovely week. My son is still in the hospital, <clears throat> uh, and I will get back to you guys. We'll have a meeting next week for sure. Okay, have a lovely weekend.